Today's class is entitled, How Do I Search for My Ancestors Online? Our presenter is James Tanner, who has made lifelong contributions in most, if not all, areas related to genealogy. James and his wife, Ann, have spent countless hours teaching and training others to enhance their respective ability to use the tools available to find and identify lost ancestors. We appreciate James' willingness to share his knowledge and the time he has spent to help us with our challenges and to help us improve our own abilities to do genealogy. We'll now turn the time over to Elder Tanner. We'd like to welcome everybody here today. We're happy to have everybody online. This question came up in the chat before we got started, and I would point out that if you do not get an answer to your chat during the course of what we're talking about here today, then be sure to email that to the email address, and we will answer the, any other questions if there's not a, let's say, call it a satisfactory re resolution of any question. So we're going to be talking today about how do I search for my ancestors online. So I'm going to kind of give a glimpse into how I use the internet, and uh, I may make some a few editorial comments, but I'll try to keep it as as uh, straightforward as simple as I can. So we're going to kind of get going here by starting out explaining that you you need to have and use a combination of websites to find your ancestors' records online. And I would add, in order to find just about anything, you, you have to be able to look through a lot of different websites, whether you're trying to buy a product or whether you're trying to find out some information for a report or whatever you're trying to do. It is it's not very wise to stick with the same set of websites all the time. And in genealogy, unfortunately, that kind of becomes the case in a lot of instances. So we have, uh, and I run into people almost continually who say, no, I just do all my research on ancestry, or, oh, I just do all my research on family search, or my heritage, or whatever. The answer to that is, they don't all have the same records. And not only do they not have the same records, they do not have the same ability to find information about a particular person. There's different levels of that, whether it be find my past or ancestry or my heritage or family search or any of the other websites. So when you're doing research online, you're looking at a whole bunch of stuff all at once, and it may become overwhelming, and, it, and it, sometimes you get lost. But you're the one directing the research. It's like you're the one driving the car, and so you get to make the turns and decide where you want to go. And just as long as you remember that. Now, the other thing you might want to remember and is pointed out to me frequently is look at your history. If you're using a browser like Chrome, then you're going to have a history or Firefox. You're going to have a history of all the websites you've looked at. And so going back, is a, not a problem. You can go back even days and find a website that you've looked at. So you have a history, you know where you've been, and so you can go forward. But I'm encouraging everybody to broaden their minds about which websites are valuable, and I'll point out some of that as we go along. So be aware that there are still billions and billions, not stars, but billions and billions of records out there that are not yet digitized or are free, that are not freely available online. So you're, you're not looking at the entire uh, corpus of, of uh, records that could be possibly available. You're only looking at what's been in a sense, put into digital format and made available over the internet. And we may think that we're overwhelmingly full of information out there with billions of records, but we always have to remember that, that, that those there are limits to that. And there is particularly in different countries, there are record sets that are not yet digitized. Now, the one example from the United States of America is the National Archives. Uh, the National Archive has billions of records, literally, uh, and they're on paper. And only a almost immeasurably small percentage of those have been digitized. 
So most, if you're if you're ever finding that the records you need are just simply don't seem to be available online, but they are available in the catalog for the National United States National Archives, the NARA National Ar- Archives and Records Administration. Then you're basically going to have to go to the National Archives in Washington D.C. or one of the other branch offices and look at the and try and look at the, at the physical records or do the research, which may take a considerable amount of effort, time, and perhaps money, because if you can't don't live in Washington, you may have to stay in a hotel or something. So it's not as simple as it seems to to do that. And so I'm always interested when somebody claims that they've seen everything, and I'll talk about that in a minute. It's, it's interesting, though, to point out that the four largest genealogy websites combined claim to have about some 50 billion images altogether. So if you're talking about the four biggest ones are Family Search, Ancestry, Find My Past, and My Heritage. Under if, with, if you believe the numbers, all those um, websites have over 50 billion records on them. Obviously, there's some overlap. Uh, all of them have U.S. Census records, for example. That's the simplest thing to understand. But uh, most of them, every one of, every one of them, have unique records that are not available on the others. But how many unique records are there? We don't know. And how are they counted? Do they all count them? They all count them different ways. And comparing them is not. It, it isn't possible. There are some comparisons you can make between ancestry and family search, or ancestry and my heritage, or whatever. But when it gets right down to it. You need to be there and look on each one of those websites, for example, if you want to know if a certain record is available on those four websites. Now, that's not going to take you out to the other websites that may have records that aren't even on those websites. So it's, it's inter- it, you've just got to get this concept in your head that when you're looking for information, you may run into situations where you have to, to where you have to branch out into areas that don't that aren't the same things that you've been using for a long time. And so there's, and and realize this, the number of websites on the internet is is about 1.7 billion websites. We're not talking about records, we're talking about different websites. And if you were to look at 1 billion, just if you didn't ignore 0.7 billion of them, 700 million websites out there, and you were only going to look at one billion of them for one second each. It would take you 31 years, 251 days, seven hours and 46 minutes and 40 seconds to look at one billion websites. If you only stayed on the site for one second. So the answer is nobody is going to be able to do that. So we need to have the tools. We need to, to understand that we have tools that help us sift through all of that vast amount of information to try and bring it directly. And I'm gonna try to show kind of how that works so that you can understand. Now I did a search here on Google for Tanner. I got 167 million results in 0.66 seconds. So let's just proceed with the assumption that no one could ever find everything that might be on the internet. Unless they just, even if you spend all your time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, It'd take you years just to look at a a significant percentage of the websites, which by the time you got through with 31 years, there would be probably another billion websites out there. So it's not going to help to to think in terms of being exhaustive searches. Um, So there must be a way to find things on the Internet or the Internet would be totally useless. There's got to be a way. There's got to be some path through the maze that you can follow to to find things on the internet? And the answer is, yeah, there are search engines. Search engines find information on the internet. That's all you need to know. It's it's a search engine is is a very complicated computer program that goes through and checks and, and searches for terms on the internet. And what Google does, for example, is it builds a virtual index of major terms. I mean, it doesn't try to search for every the and 
all the little connecting words and things like that. But any other major word out there in every language is, is indexed. And then all instances of those and whatever their organization pattern is, it's, it's there. They have this every organizational pat pattern. And then you have um, all these different search engines. There's probably uh, dozens of search engines out there. There are essentially two or three that are used by 90% of all the people who, who work on the internet. And uh, the three are already up there. It's Google, Bing, and Yahoo. And those are the three probably that, that take care of about, and I didn't ever looked at it, but Google's always run about 70 to 80% of all the use on the internet or higher. And so none of these, none of, none of the other companies have managed to, to do much to erode uh, Google's dominance in the search engine market. And by the way, this particular um, image has SEO, which is search engine optimization. If you've ever wondered what they're talking about when they're talking about SEO. And what that means is there's a, a methodology for getting your information high enough up in the search engines ranks that you actually appear when people go look for it. And probably the simplest way to do that to optimize your search engine is to pay Google or pay the other websites, the other search engines to put your, your ads up at the front at the top. So that's why you see ads at the top or the first thing you come to is because somebody's paid these people to put them there. And then you can go skip through all the ads and start in where the actual searches occur. But the ranking of the searches, what you get in the rank of the searches is determined by whether or not uh, individual uh, websites have incorporated this, these principles of search engine optimization, which are kind of like learning about marketing or any other topic where you're trying to uh, make yourself stand out in a crowd. Okay, so you've got this going. But I've got one thing, if, I, if you don't get anything else, understand that searching is a skill. Searching on the internet is a skill. It's something you have to learn. It's not something you can just sit down and say, oh, I'm going to find and, and expect to have results. It's something you have to do over and over and over again. So let me just give you an example of how that works. So I'm gonna search for Henry Martin Tanner, Arizona pioneer, and he lived in St. Joseph, Arizona. And there are 4,800,870,000 results in 75.75, less than a minute, second. So, what happens is every one of the things on that screen that just came up deal with that person. In other words, my search for Henry Martin Tanner, my great grandfather, was successful because I have this many results and they come from different places. The first one's uh, obviously Amazon wanting me to buy a book. It, Archives West is a or a website that has catalogs, catalogs the collections of various archives. And then there's Genie, which is a family tree program and byu.edu. That's us at BYU. The Ancestor Files is a blog written by my daughter and another one by Ancestor Files. Now, why did all these come up in this order? The secondary part of it is going to be how many times someone has searched for that specific item. So if we look at this, the people looked and searched and found and then clicked on and looked at the Amazon entry more than any of these other entries. And so there's there's sort of generally ranked in the order in which they most seem the most obvious that are going to be found. And so that helps you if you understand that. If you understand that the information you're going to get is going to be organized so that where most people would have looked is where you get first. And if you understand that maybe what you're looking for is really obscure and, and nobody has really much looked for it previously, which may be the case, with one of your ancestors, 
then you may have to search further down the list to uh, to find an, an entry. Uh, how many pages of, of searches do I go through for Google? It's very rare that I will go past one page or two pages. Because if I don't get it up to the top or close to the top of what I'm looking for, I figure I haven't communicated well enough with the computer to get the information that I need. So I'm going to start changing my search terms immediately upon um, uh, finding out that I haven't seen it in the first couple of pages. Now, it may be that I'm looking for things that are repetitious. For instance, I may be looking for images for a presentation, and then I might go pages, 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 because I'm getting all these different images. It's so general that I'm getting a whole bunch of information, and all I really want to look at is a lot of images. So that would take me past the first couple of pages. But if I'm looking for something specific, then I would be changing the way that I did the wording. The computer world is based on a series of algorithms. And even though you have 4.8 million results, the first ones came up about Henry. Okay, so the idea here is the more you know, the more you can find. And, and we're going to come back to this, but we start with what we know and we, and we move incrementally, step-by-step step, out to the things that we don't know. So when you're looking for something online, you have to put in what you know. And then if you learn more information about the ancestor, the person, then you can add more different types of things to the, to the search engine so that you come up with a different uh, set of, of results from each search. And, and so basically, if I go to this, if I look for Henry Martin Tanner, Arizona, I then I get 5 million, I get more results. I got a million more results almost than I did a moment ago. But in the same case, I still have the same thing. Why is that the case? Well, because Henry Martin Tanner is a name and it's maybe very common. Actually, there are other, there's famous people with that name. And so it's, you have to differentiate sometimes. But I put in a qualifier and that's Arizona. And so there probably hasn't been that many Henry Martin Tanners who lived in Arizona or who were referred to by the full name of Henry Martin Tanner, for example, instead of Henry M. I could look for Henry M. Tanner. I could look for Henry Tanner. I could look for any other things. And I would get different results each time. So it depends on what I'm looking for. If I'm just looking for general information, then I already have a huge amount of information to process if that's if that's what I want to look for. I could also look for images. I could look for any other thing that I needed to know about this person. Okay, so let's let's change the topic. So for example, I go looking for my grandfather, Leroy Parkinson Tanner, and I'm going to put in the place where he lived, which was St. John's Apache County, Arizona. And now I'm finding specific genealogical information. Now I can I could qualify this very simply and make it more genealogically oriented by putting in the word genealogy. So if I'd put in Leroy Parkinson Tanner, St. John's genealogy, then I would get even more specific information from genealogy websites, websites where the word genealogy appeared in the context with Leroy Tan Parkinson Tanner and so forth. Now, this brings up a subject that um, is, is always kind of comes up whenever you talk about searching online. Uh, there is an underlying set of, of logical rules that apply to everything that's out there on the internet. And it's based on a, a type of algebra called Boolean algebra. And they're it's you, they use greater than, less than, includes, does not include. It's kind of set theory process that you can go through to do searching. Uh, I I have learned that entire thing. I used to used to play um, actually play games with set theory, and I was very much familiar with all of the terminology and how it works and all this because we were playing competing with each other about set theory. Um, 
and so basically what's uh, what happens is that and people say well why don't you use all these different things like minus or included or all this kind of stuff so it takes me more time to think through how i'm going to formulate a question that uses boolean algebra then it takes me to find it to find what i'm looking for because i can go and put in well, someone's putting together their plus minus this, that adding this or wanting this, they may not even be correct. And in, at the end results is that when they've done the formula, there may not be anything out there that exactly complies with that formula. And so what I've used is just, I just keep varying the terms in my head and, and thinking of how is it that I can find this person and anything that comes up, for example, here, the first entry comes up is, is obviously it's on Wikitree and it's my grand, my grandfather. And it says home in St. John's Apache County. Now I have additional information. It's Apache County. In 1930, I have another search term, 1930. He was a farmer, another search term. They've got children, another search term. In other words, there's more information. Every time you look and search, you're given uh, more information. That's why you start with what you know and don't just jump out and grab some uh, person because you don't have enough information sometimes to differentiate that person from everyone else with the same name. You need to have some unique. How do you do that? By working backwards step by step in time, doing your pedigree in incremental steps so that when you do get to a point where you have someone you need to look for, then you can basically use all the information that you've acquired so far to narrow down the broad categories that you might use to find that person. So let's start it again, do it again. This one's Marinus Christensen, who's another one of my grandfathers, great grandfathers, and he lived in Arizona and he came from Denmark. And I didn't have, I didn't put in his birth date. I didn't have, to, I didn't put in his spouse's name. I could have done all that. And, or my grandmother's name, you know, my great grandmother's name and all that kind of information if I knew it, but maybe I only know this much. But I can still come up with some possible solutions to that. And it's especially care helpful if I use Arizona. And if I said genealogy, once again, I could point out that I would probably get more information. And I can go through these references here and tell me whether or not this is my grandfather, my great grandfather. So I'm using the information that I know offhand to do searches and then using further information that I obtain to go forward. Now, let me kind of put that in terms of what happens. So let's say I know that Marina says Christensen, my grandmother's name was Jesse Christensen. And I know that she was born in Arizona. And so I know that when she was born, her parents lived, were living, and they were living in Arizona. That's all I know. Okay, so now I can start searching for, and I know his name, and I know her father's name. But if I didn't know her father's name, then I would search for Jesse Christensen in Arizona, the daughter instead of the, the father. And if I found her genealogy, someone might already know who her father was, or there might be a record. And if I wanted to know if she was in a census record, I could put her name, put the word census. If I wanted to know if she was birth, I could put birth record. I could put records. I could put anything that I'm actually looking for instead of, instead of thinking in terms of, well, it didn't give me the answer I wanted. And so I don't think, you know, that's not how it works. Okay, so how does it work? If you can, try adding some additional information to your search. I mean, you can go overboard and then to the point where no, no results because you've added so many qualifiers in there that it won't, won't produce any information at all. But if you, reason, if you rotate the words through and get different things, uh, different aspects of where you're looking for or what, then that adds information that you can use to, to look further and get more information from your searches. 
Now, I would suggest this. I will suggest this to everyone when they start out, when they're if they've been doing this for 50 years or whatever it is, whatever whatever level you happen to be at when you are doing searches online, what I suggest is that every time you get you want to look at a relative or you need information about a relative, go do a Google search. You never know what new has been added or what's available or what's going to happen. And then start using some terms about your relative. That's just what I'm kind of illustrating here. And then you'll find additional information. And some of that's going to be surprising information. So let me give you an example here. Uh, this is one of my great-great-grandparents, direct line ancestor, Joseph DeFries. And um, I found some a reference that said he was a his profession as a feather merchant. So I looked for Joseph to freeze with feathers. Now, there were only 45,700 results compared to those millions before. But what we got was records on the internet that said that talked about Joseph DeFries and feathers. Now, one thing that happened here that was interesting was that I got a, a result from this one happens to be predictable because it was my daughter, Ben and I already knew it, but it's just for illustration's sake of Joseph DeFries and the freedom of the city of London. Now, the freedom of the city of London was like a recognition. You actually were an official uh, merchant in the city of London and it gave you some per some very prestigious um, uh, access to people to the possible markets and all that sort of thing and it was a really great advertising thing too so he was this this is what he was he sold the ostrich feathers that were on the heads of the black horses who were drawing the hearses through the city of London for the burials. He had almost, as far as I'm able to determine, almost a virtual monopoly in supplying the feathers for the horses. And the interesting thing about it is that is that sometimes those horses couldn't get through the whole job without ruining it because, you know, they flip their heads around and then they bump into things and whatever. And so he was, it was like an almost continual demand for his products. And so this was uh, this was why he became you know sort of an important person in London, and uh, all of this was found, by the way, when we first started, by doing searches on Joseph de Vries and not even knowing that he was the first discovery was found. We found he was freedom at the City of London, and then we didn't understand why, but we eventually got enough information from our searches to determine that it was because he sold these black ostr or ostrich feathers that were dyed dark black for the funerals. But we looked for another Joseph George de Vries or Joseph de Vries, and we find out that he gave a deposition. And this was just a, a search. And so we have, we've created, we've, we've done searches. But we haven't spent a lot of our time crafting really crafty searches because we would have no concept when we started the search that we would find a deposition that he gave but this isn't the same to freeze this is a doctor this is dr joseph george de Vries, who was the son of joseph de Vries. so basically uh, you can't pre prejudge or pre-guess what kind of information you're going to find about the person when you do a research, when you're starting to do searches, it, you just don't know what you're going to find. <clears throat> but you know, if you know, if you keep doing it, that you know, it, it, you find results. Okay, so you say that's not fair. You know too much. What if you don't know anything? Well, what I'm trying to say is, you do know some. You have to know something. Obviously, you have to know your name. You have to know a little bit about yourself. Perhaps you have to know your parents' names all of those things but as you gain information you use this use your information to move forward and you don't try to pre-guess and you don't try to jump and you don't try to go to say oh they came from england let's go search for him in england that's not the way this works it works systematically person by person going back 
establishing parent-child relationships and basically working your way through all this information that's out there on the internet. And what I am saying is that even given your existing amount of information you have about someone, uh, you probably will find more information that you didn't know if you do a, a search, especially for people born in the last 100 years. Anybody that was born in the 20, 20th or 21st century are probably overly information saturated. In other words, there's just so much information about every individual. You say, well, I can't find anything at all about my... Well, I just don't ever buy into that. I don't ever buy into that you can't find information because every time I focus on a an individual in the in the fam in the, any place in the family tree, I seem to buy, find additional information. It may not be the information that I need or want, but I find more information. Okay, so kind of summarizing that genealogical information is incremental. That is, we go step by step, and that basically comes back to the same underlying premise of genealogical information, and that is you research from what you know to what you don't know. But you have to use what you know to formulate the questions that you're asking the internet to answer, Google to answer, or whoever's using your search engine. Now, I, this is the editorial comment. The editorial comment is, you may be comfortable using uh, an alternative search engine like Bing or Yahoo or whatever, and you use that and you're comfortable with that. You're missing a significant amount of information. In previous years, when I was writing my blog, which is Genealogy Star, I would um, do search engine comparisons. I mean, it's just not relevant anymore. So by searching on Google, I would find some very specific information about an ancestor if I made the exact same search on the other websites. There would be varying degrees of lack of that information. In other words, I might find 10 items on a person on Google and only one or two of those items would show up on any other of the search engines. So if you really uh, think you're focused in on something and you have objections to Google because they're big and you don't want to deal with them and boo about Google, then that's fine. But you're going to have to pay the price of not having the vast amount of exposure that that program has developed over the years. And so uh, I'm not saying don't use the other websites. What I'm saying is don't fail to use Google search if you're uh, if you're serious about finding um, more information. So always use it in addition to, not instead of some other website. Okay, so here's an important thing to know about family search, and this is another kind of a window into it. Almost everything. Now we're gonna qualify that because living people are not searchable on family search. That doesn't mean they're not searchable on the Google, on the internet. I can find living people. As a lawyer working in a law firm, uh, we found living people almost every day by searching on the internet. That was just part of the process that we went through. And we found out a lot of information about them. There's more information. If you knew how much information that they had about you, you wouldn't be concerned about privacy. You would just wish that you did someplace else, but it wouldn't happen. Okay. But that's another topic for another day. But basically, family search is based on Google. It's, it's a, a Google program. And secondarily, it is based on Microsoft. But Microsoft search engine is not the one that is able to search everything that's on family search. So what do I mean by everything? Well, all the memories, for example, all of the information in the catalog and all of that. Sometimes when you're having trouble finding something on, on the family search website, uh, I just go out to Google and do the search and then find it immediately. So we can find something as quickly doing a Google search sometimes as we can by trying to find it uh, using searching on family search. 
So you can see here, there's the, the freezes that I was using as the as an example. Uh, all of this family search, family search. So basically, this is going to take you directly to a link. Obviously, you need to you'll need to register, sign in, and be using family search in order for that to work. Okay, what about people with the same name? Okay, if you got your if your search terms are vague, then you'll end up with nine hundred and sixty million results in half a second, but you won't ever be able to to penetrate this. It just is never going to get you penetrable. In this case, searching for John Jones is not productive. And you're going to find that John Jones is so common that it just isn't going to, it's not going to happen on the internet. So how do you do this? Well, you go back to the what I talked about, about a moment ago. You begin the process of adding your own information, whatever you already know about this person, and um, using that to kind of bootstrap yourself into uh, what you can, what you find online. So if your John Jones has to be, you have to think of something that makes your John Jones unique. And if that's the case, it may be where they were born, it may be uh, their wife's name it may help, names of their children may help, names of the of the places where they lived may help anything that may tie that into a record that has that information and differentiates that information from all the vast amount of information that there is out in the internet world in the online world of digitized records so you have to know something and blind searching is called surfing the internet that's what they've called it for a lot of years and i can tell you this i categorically never surf the internet the only time i approach the internet it's a tool for me it's a tool it's a tool i use to find information and i am always asking for specific information that doesn't mean i don't find things that i don't want to know or don't want to look at but that does mean that I insulate myself from just being out there looking at stuff, like driving down the freeway and looking at a series of billboards that I didn't choose and I didn't want to look at. So this is fun, plus all the bad stuff that's on the internet, obviously. And this is how you kind of insulate yourself from the bad stuff, is you don't ever look with open-ended general type of searches or click on links out there and things oh this looks interesting no that's like going out into the woods like hansel and gretel and not coming to a very good end on that story okay so here how about this james p hamilton born about 1789 well if you know the birth date about even about birthday you're going to get a bunch of James Hamiltons. Not all these James Hamiltons are, are not going to be this one. Now, we don't even know for sure which one this is. So we have to come up with more information and determine. Once again, if you're jumped out there and you've chosen a, a blank spot on your family tree and you're going to find that person and you don't know anything about anybody that, that any of his descendants or her descendants then you're going to be just lost. I mean, it's not going to be productive. But if you build step by step, as I've been saying, and go step by step back to this person, then you'll know about where they lived. And they lived in Kentucky. Okay, he was born in Kentucky. So we have a little bit. So the first one there, James Hamilton, is the one that's in Kentucky. So and I also suggest uh, when you look at it, that family search has all of these other partner programs out there the family search partner programs now granted the partnership family uh, partner programs are um, paywall uh, subscription programs every one of those besides family search uh, which is free uh, but to members of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints 
because they are par partners with Family Search, then members of the church have access to those programs. But even people who have that access, I find all the time, who have never looked at them. Oh, well, I don't know anything about ancestry, and I haven't done any research. I haven't looked on ancestry. Well, it, you're simply ignoring obvious additional information that may be uh, helpful to you in um, in finding your ancestors and adding information about their lives. And uh, you need to know which the strengths and weaknesses of each of those. And, and here on the BYU uh, Family History Library YouTube channel, there are videos on every one of those programs. So you can go out and get information that you need out of those programs. And don't, and don't forget that the bottom of that list is Google. So if you needed any reminder that Google is associated with, with uh, family search, then that's pretty obvious. Okay, uh, as an example, while I was putting together this presentation some time ago, on the day that I worked on this presentation up to the point up to this point in the presentation, in other words, when I got here, I thought, oh, I'm going to look and see how many searches I've done today. I had done a total of over 140 Google searches. Actually, I just, I got tired of counting the number of searches that I had done that time period in just doing this, this particular presentation. So if it gives you an idea on any given day when I start working on the computer, I may do a couple of hundred or hundreds even. Of, of, of searches over and over again. And I certainly don't have time to sit there and create some logical Boolean algebra kind of stuff to do with those searches. I just have to search uh, based on how I think I might be able to find the information. And, and, I, and believe me, it's work. And the other thing that I have to say is, do you need to practice? Of course, it's a skill. And you need to practice and practice and practice how to doing it. The more searches you do, the more your mind will be able to kind of second guess where that information might be and what kinds of terms put together. People ask me all the time, what if I, you know, do you get different searches if you vary the order that you search in? The answer is absolutely yes. If I put in Arizona first, for example, looking for my great grandfather then I'll get all the Arizona stuff first. Well, I'm not gonna find my grandfather and all the Arizona stuff. If I put in Arizona and then I put in Joseph City, then that's still gonna create a problem because they're still gonna be not specific. And the only when I add Henry Martin Tanner. So that would be specific. But if I start with Henry Martin Tanner and then qualify it, I'm going to come up with, a, with Henry Martin Tanner being the first thing it looks for and then qualifying it with the other. So. Think of it in terms, the first term is your search term. That succeeding terms are your qualifiers. They're going to tell you um, how, what, what about the first term uh, in that search. That's how it's going to work. And so you do it. And so what if you don't find any results? What if you're out there in the desert and there's nothing out there and you can't find anything at all? Well, the answer to that is that means you haven't looked for the right thing. Now, is it possible that some subject or some topic or some person that you're looking for does, has not appeared in any digitized document in all the billions of digitized documents out there? And the answer is yes. It is very possible that that's why I started with the, with the concept that there were billions and billions of documents out there that, that have not been digitized, have not been included in any searches. And it's very possible the only, the only um, records of your particular ancestor fall into that category. And so you are going to have to step aside and go find some of the documents. But you won't know you didn't find anything until you've done a whole lot of searches until you've searched and searched and searched, then you might get to clue up finally that you haven't, uh, that it's not out there. Now, I use, unequivocally, I use 
archive.org as much as I do any other program. Why? Because archive.org has over 35 million books completely searchable word for word free. This is a free website and it is the largest online fully usable website in the in the world that I am aware of. There is nothing out there that comes even vaguely close to the Internet Archive, which is archive.org. That's all you have to type in. If you haven't researched in this, you simply are missing the largest library in the world. This doesn't have every book in the world, but it has more digitized material that's available. And they say, well, what about all the copyright stuff? The answer is they've solved that. This is a library. And as such, they can loan you the books, even if they're copyrighted, as long as they have a copy of the book, which they do. And because they have copies of the book, then and or the ones that are copyrighted that they have copies of, they can loan it to you. Maybe it's only for an hour, but you can then renew that until you read the entire book or use and research the book. And any books that are not copyrighted or not restricted in some way, you can download the entire book to your website if you want you, your own your own computer. And the amount of information in here is overwhelmingly large. And it's not just books, it's videos, it's audio files, it's TV programs, it's computer programs. It's uh, every kind of information that you can digitize and put into a computer is on this. And the Wayback Machine, which is the big thing up there has 725 billion web pages it's the history of the internet of an uh, actual recorded history of almost every website on the internet okay so now you have so here's an example i look for james p hamilton uh, on our internet archive i find him uh, almost immediately in a book uh, on kentucky where he came from and it turns out uh, that this particular um, uh, item came from the report of the debates and proceedings of the convention for the revision of the constitution of the state of Kentucky in 1849. So my guy was in this. So that gives me more information and more places to look. And actually this is a person that I would need to know more information about because it's one of the ones that uh, gets really confusing back there. So, when you find out that you have all of this information is when you can do it. So each time you find some information about an ancestor, you can use that information to find more information. And uh, once that I know something like that, that he was in a constitutional convention, that gives me a, a leverage to try to find additional information. And you'll never know what you'll find. It's just out there. And it may be surprising, it may be confirming that what you know, or whatever. Okay, well, thanks for watching.